I got these at a New York City flea market for 10 bucks. They're Japanese from the 60s. And looky there. Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. Hey, this is George the Antique Nomad, and since I'm temporarily not nomading along with everyone else, I wanted to show you a room in the house and we can talk about fun things that I live with every day and maybe you'll be inspired to do a video and show us some of the stuff that you have in your house that's antique and vintage or thrifted that you live with every day. So let's go take a look. I'm in St. Pete, Florida. You can see the Tropicana Dome behind me. Let's flip the camera and we'll go into my apartment. Okay, so we're going to swing the door open here, and this is my little co-op place that I spend a little time in the winter uh, when I'm doing shows and sales and the like down in Florida. And this is a place that I have decorated just like you would see if it was 1956 and someone just moved in here. So this is a, an airbrushed watercolor combination by Freeman from Honolulu. You can see the signature here. This is going to be a 1940s or 50s piece. And I just found another one that I need to hang. And this one's also a Freeman. So this is a name we see a lot in Hawaiian airbrush in that period of time. Then let's swing around here. So I've got the bark cloth on the door covering the window. And let's pull back from the first sort of entry wall here. I've got a little bit of uh, red and maroon going here because those are colors I like. I used to have a big maroon couch that this sat over. This is another Hawaiian watercolor. And this piece actually walked in the door when I was working at Antiques at Pike in Seattle at Pike Place Market. There was an antique mall there for many years and I worked there for a while and was a dealer there. And someone came in and had this to sell and I paid $40 because I just loved it and wanted it for my house. This piece here is the Stone God. This is one of the original treasure craft tiki gods from about 1960. And of course, I wrote the book on this company. And I don't remember whether this piece is in the book. I think maybe a catalog photo of it is. I think I got this after the book was written. It's a very hard piece to find. I've never had another one. Here's another cute piece. Now, this is a print made to look like an airbrush. If we get up close to it, you're going to see... I think you'll see sort of a texturing to the paper. There you go. That gives you an idea that it's a print. But it's a really cute one. And my uh, good friend Tom Gores, who runs Epic Antique in Seattle, gave that to me years ago. And that's a priced piece because of that for me. Over here for you thrifters, the little fish tile. I think I paid $2.99 at a Goodwill. It's some studio artist from Florida, and I just thought it was really cute. And next to it, I've got a 1950s juicer. I just got that piece, and it works fantastically well. And then next to it is a piece of Duncan Sanibel. Uh, Sanibel's an island key down the coast from here in Florida. And Sanibel was a very popular pattern in the uh, late 40s and early 50s. I love the way they use the opalescence to suggest the shell. Down here, we have shrimp cocktail icers, of course, because... You need those in Florida sometimes. This thing's kind of fun. I know they say don't an open umbrella in the house, but I think that we're all having as much luck as we can stand right now, so I'm not going to worry about superstitions. But this was done by the St. Petersburg Times, which is now called the Tampa Bay Times, and this umbrella actually features... Whoa, this is going to be a little blur here while I get this open, but isn't this cool? They gave these out for years, and so you'll see different iterations of them, but they're all various cartoons on these umbrellas that the newspaper used to give out as a promotion. So I thought that was really neat, and I had to keep one because it's fun to walk down the street with cartoons. And so that's my umbrella. Now in the middle here, I was really into Art Deco. I still love it, and I had a house that had a lot of Art Deco at one time. The piece in the middle is Donald Desky. This is actually a medicine cabinet. Uh, this particular one was used at a dentist's office in Beverly Hills. And you open it up and it actually has little 
holes in there where you would put various uh, bottles and things, but it's great for keeping my checkbooks and bills and that sort of thing. I like having it as an entry desk. I really like Donald Desky's work. He is considered a very good designer. And my friend Stephanie spotted this. Some couple pulled up, unloaded a truck, and started having an impromptu sale. And this was $100. It's a fantastic piece worth about seven times that. This here is a Florida artist as well, Barushan. This is an artist proof. This print reflects the time when Zodiac was a really big deal and people were really interested in astrological signs and their meanings. And it dates 1972. My friend Walter gave that to me and so that's a price piece also. A lot of my favorite things are things people gave me over the years. Hello there everybody. This mirror is English Art Deco and this was made in about 1940. I think I'd worked in the antique business about two months and a dealer brought this into Centralia Square and I just loved it and had to have it and have had it ever since. Now this treasure craft tiki god looks Hawaiian but he is straight out of Compton and I'm going to show you that. On the back, treasure craft 1959 Compton, California number 550. Treasure craft made most of the Hawaiian wear in Hawaii. So the Hawaiian pavilion at the Seattle World's Fair, the state pavilion, was full of treasure craft pieces you could buy in their gift shop because it was made in Hawaii at that time. That set off such a mania that all sorts of surf shops and tiki shops and places all up and down the West Coast started ordering it. And so the California plant made some as well. It's dated 1959 because that's the year that the designer came out with this design in Hawaii, but it wasn't made in Compton for a couple of years after it's that. Here I do collect barware and you'll see some more in a little bit here. Now on the left I have the Osterizer. This is the classic beehive from the 1950s. They reproduced these in the late 80s, early 90s. The reproductions were selling for $80 a piece. I paid $20 for this perfect working one at an antique store. On the right is a piece that we don't see often in America. It's very Art Deco looking, but it's actually from after the Second World War. This is Cherry Bakelite, or technically Catalan, in the handles, and then Chrome. And this piece is by a company called Glow Hill. Glow Hill was made in Canada in the 50s and 60s. It's mainly very modernist looking, and it always has this great cherry red, or uh, sometimes a butterscotch Bakelite for the handles and it's very collectible now. Canadians know it and some Americans do too. I just love the little faces on these guys and the way that he's staring up at us. These are alligator salt and pepper shakers from the 1950s. And then you'll see Capri Blue Glass. I particularly like the dots pattern here. And I like these pieces because these little cocktail glasses look like Mercury space capsule. Splash down. Dots was a line made by the Continental Can Company, uh, which was Hazel Atlas originally. And those were done in the 1960s. You used to find a lot of them in central Washington. I think a gas station used to give them out there. So I got those really cheaply at the Custer's Antique Show in Spokane over a couple year period. And then here we have a mask and a, well, hmm, another thing. The mask actually is a reproduction and I've got a couple around. I'll show you another one here. But these are based on the only wooden masks found from Florida's original indigenous cultures. They found a group of five or six of these in a saline bog that had somehow been preserved. Wooden things don't last in Florida. They are all at the State Museum in Jacksonville. And I met one of the archaeologists who discovered them. I got interested and a local artist was doing recreations of them and I got them. This piece is from New Guinea, my dear friend Laurel. I'm not sure what made her think of me when she saw this piece, but it is a sheath worn to cover a um, certain part of the body when you are wearing nothing else other than perhaps a loincloth. Uh, anyway, moving on. This piece is Kushinov, uh, Nikolai Kushinov. He was an artist in Seattle and is a fairly known regional artist. These are called the Seabirds. This is from 1958, and I thought it was a neat little painting. I like having regional art, and I've got a lot of Seattle regional artists because I spent so much time there. 
Real quickly, I'll give you a quick look inside the bathroom. I know this is really not the same room that we're doing, but it's bonus. Uh, this banner is from the 1940s or early 50s. It's from the Festival of States, which was a big parade that honored all 50 states in St. Petersburg. They had that every year for years. And then let's get some light on in here and see if that helps so that you can see this really great concrete wall fish. This actually is made to go on the outside of a house. My friend Norm, who sets up across from me at Mount Dora, had this, and also another piece that I'll show you in a moment. And I just thought they would be really great because they match my 1956 blue-yellow tiled bathroom. The shower doors came from a house in Tampa. We did an estate sale. The house was built in 1947 and was going to be torn down because South Tampa is really gentrified. These doors were in the bath and I thought they were so perfect. And so I had them removed and installed here. I'm still working on the bathroom here. So there's a cabinet that's missing from there that's out for painting. This is the other concrete piece. It's dated 1957. Again, these were made to be able to be on the outside of a house here in Florida, but I just loved it and had to put it on the inside of mine. And then these also came from a Florida estate here in St. Pete, actually, in a really neat area called Driftwood, which used to be its own little enclave out on the shore, and the houses are really funky and interesting, and these were linoleum cut. So they would actually cut linoleum and they would make these prints. Lino cut is a popular form in around the 1930s and 40s. And there's a really cool Japanese seahorse from the 50s that I thrifted for, I think, $6.99. And then I'm going to turn this light off so you can see it better. This light bar came from my friend Dave's 1974 condominium in Jupiter, Florida. They were remodeling that bathroom and he came to stay with me when he was uh, doing a show here and said, hey, I've got the perfect thing for your bathroom, and it really is. And then here we have a 1950s era Sunshine City St. Petersburg Festival of States banner with Billy Sunshine, who was the glowing orb logo for the city's tourism in the 1950s and 60s. And there are businesses around town that still use this logo. He's so bright, he needs sunglasses. So moving in here, uh, we'll look at the little dining area here. I've got a bamboo table and chairs, and this is also from the 50s. Came from a swap meet here in the St. Petersburg area. I think I paid 100 for that set. And on top of it is a set of Stetson Rio. So you look at this and you think, wow, so tropical, it looks like bark cloth, which I thought was really fun about it. But in reality, this was made in Illinois and hand-painted in the 1950s. My friend Pam Elder, who had a shop in Centralia, Washington, called Elderly Things. I used to be a picker before I was a dealer, and I would bring things in, and she bought this coffee carafe from me. It got her so excited that she went out and started collecting, ended up with a 12-piece set of these, and sadly she passed on a few years ago, and her family asked me to help sell the estate, and I just had a sentimental twinge, plus looked at how great it looked on my table, and said, oh yes, I think I have to buy this from them, so I did. The other pieces in the back there are mainly inventory, a few things I have to take back to consigners, the big shell collection is uh, from a Danish lady here in St. Pete who I'm selling it for, and the doll trunk is actually going to my cousin in California. She saw it on my Instagram post and said, ooh, I want that, so that one's going away. I also am a barware collector, and I wanted to show some of these items because they're a lot of fun. I have the soccer ball decanter from the 70s that I thrifted at a store in Seattle for under $10. These glasses here are Dorothy Thorpe. Now, Dorothy Thorpe sometimes has a DT etched mark on the bottom, but these do not. You just have to know her patterns, but you can study these. Dorothy Thorpe did a lot of really fun floral things, very tropical, 1940s era. I think I paid five or six a piece for those, and they're certainly worth about double that. But back here, we have a bunch of a collection called Fractured French. And Fractured French was done by an illustrator named Richard Taylor. Richard Taylor, obviously, you get an idea from the cover, the sense of humor. Here's the young lady with mother, father, and the other museum goers, and oh my goodness, she's in that picture. 
he definitely had a ribald sense of humor. This book came out in 1942. By the 50s, Fractured French had become rather a sensation, and so they did all sorts of things. They did a series of plates, and it's Fractured French because they took French expressions and then butchered the English translations. For example, carte blanche means, for God's sakes, take Blanche home, because she's obviously had enough. Tu en famille, which is, let's get drunk at home. If you've heard me massacre French in my pronunciations on this channel before, you'll understand why that actually appeals to me. Now in here, this is House of Representatives, if you can see the logo, House of Representatives USA. That is a line by Fostoria Glass called Contour, and they did those for the House of Representatives and the Senate in the mid-60s, your tax dollars at work. Almost all of the stuff are sin items, meaning cigar ashtrays, martini shakers. I mean, there's nothing sweet and wholesome about any of it, so I thought that was kind of funny. My grandfather was in the House of Representatives at one time, and that belonged to him, so that's a family piece. We've got some various swizzles here. It'll be a little hard to read, but you can see the second one is the Stork Club from New York. I like collecting them if they have famous logos and old bar names that we recognize. Behind Mr. Smiley Face here, which is from the era, I collect the shot glasses that have the reverse painted eyes. And if you take a look here, you'll see on the back, uh, well, where's a better example? She'll show better. Okay, so on the front, she's got these big googly eyes, and on the back, you see, oh, look, there's a swipe of paint with the eyes painted on the back, and so that gives them three dimension. Those are really the only shot glasses I personally collect, although shot glasses are a fun area, and you can collect thousands and thousands of different varieties. Down on this shelf, I thought these guys were so fun, I want to give them a little motion here. I got these in Seattle for 25 bucks at an antique show years ago, and I just love the way they bounce around. They are bottle stoppers with the corks in them, but you don't see them as nodders, or we call them bobbleheads now very often. Those are from the 50s. This guy, on the other hand, is significantly older because, look, it's Prohibition, and he's getting ready for Prohibition, just like a lot of us were stocking up to stay indoors these last few weeks. We have this guy and he's stocking up to stay wet throughout the 11 or 12 years of Prohibition and I suspect that he succeeded. Then Prohibition ended and that's when these coasters came out. Prohibition is over but wasn't it great while it lasted? These are 1930s comic coasters. When I'm dead don't bury me at all just pickle my bones in alcohol. There were a lot of people who were glad that Prohibition came to an end, and a lot who weren't. And here's the other end of that story. Which do you choose, extinction or distinction? This is a flash view from the late 50s or early 60s with a little bit of moralizing on it, and I thought that was really neat too. This piece is Manhattan glass. And it's done as advertising for Triple X Root Beer. And Triple X Root Beer was a big deal. There were only a few left when I was a kid in Washington State. They're all but one gone now. I think there's one in Issaquah, Washington still with the big barrel, like you can see. It was a drive-up root beer stand back in the uh, 40s and 50s especially. They had Anchor Hawking make those little ashtrays for them. If any of you remember Ed McMahon, he was the sidekick to Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show, and he was known to be rather a booze hound, and he even created this barside companion, which has games and bets and tricks and drinking games and that sort of thing. Funny thing is, if you take a look at how dusty some of these pieces are, you'll realize I don't really drink much, but I sure enjoy barware anyway. And then down here, kind of what got me started, my parents had this musical decanter. You could hear a little bit of the end of the, how dry I am if I had it wound. And that actually got me collecting these things because when my folks uh, quit drinking long, long ago, they kept that one and only one because my sisters had given it to them. And so I ended up uh, getting it when uh, my father passed on. Here we have volume one of A Guide to Pink Elephants, which is a great cocktail recipe book. And you can learn to make all sorts of things, including Applejack Vermouth Cocktail, a Gin Ricky or a Baron's Cup, which was some wine drink. So if you want to dazzle your guests by serving all these uh, old cocktails that people don't really know about anymore, 
that is a good way of going about it. This is Cambridge glass, and this is the Pink Elephant's cocktail decanter. Wonderful piece, sold for as much as $100. Uh, I think I paid $20 for mine. I was very fortunate. That's still a really cheap price. Here's some more novelty coasters. Here's to the smart man who hasn't let a woman pin anything on him since he was a baby. Here's to the girls who walk home and get their heels sore. And here's to the politicians whose greatest asset is their liability. Seems appropriate for this political year. And then someone had to get me this because they knew I collected barware. And look, this is George's new study. And then next to it, we have vote to repeal the dry law. So this is ending prohibition or a dry law somewhere in the United States. So a lot of fun things. I really enjoyed the barware. I got this nice little cart, which is a lakeside cart. We're seeing these coming out of old labs and industrial places from the 60s and 70s. And it's perfect for this sort of use. And then if you want to sit on some surprisingly strong, but yes, indeed, rather small, bar stools. I fit on them fine, but some of our larger guests actually prefer the couch. And then I've got a Florida tablecloth behind it just for color and fun. Up here I've got some old frame postcards of St. Petersburg. This shows the waterfront back in about 1905. And here's the view along the shore. This is back when St. Pete has about 5,000 people and it's just starting to be a tourist town. These two are from the 30s when the big pink Vinoy Hotel has been built. It's still there. It's wonderful. And here's the Million Dollar Pier from 1926, which is now gone. Jay Steensma was actually rather a savant. He's a fairly well-regarded regional artist. He was also kind of crazy. This one's called The Gathering, and you see his signature. Steensma unfortunately had some mental health problems and he would be doing very well, had some good commissions. And the next thing I would see him at my friend's deli and he'd be saying, I'll draw something on a napkin for you if you buy me lunch. And so a lot of people in Seattle met him rather randomly, as did I, but became kind of fascinated with his work. He even painted on paper bags when he ran out of money for canvases at one time. And the paper bags are rather collectible now. I like this piece because it shows motion. You're not sure if they're having a fight while drinking, if they're having a toast. It just had such an interesting feel and the fact that it was in a wine deli that I met Steensma just made it so appropriate for me. This painting on the right, this is a Belaze, B-A-L-A-Z-S. Belaze was the premier modern artist in Spokane, Washington in his day. And that turned out to be a big deal because he ended up being the lead artist for Expo 74. And so most of the displays that were done at Expo 74 that had to do with art had his imprimatur. And several of the murals were painted by him. But if you go to the World's Fair site in Spokane, there are still many of his sculptures around. This piece is from 1954. This is when he was just getting started. He primarily was a sculptor. That makes this a really unusual early work, and I had the good fortune to buy it from a friend of mine. We had a lovely mall in Seattle called 222 Westlake that was all modernism. It was a really fun antique store. There really wasn't anything like it in its day. We sold a ton of uh, art glass to Nordstrom, but then when the high-tech boom came in Seattle, the building was sold, and that was the end of that. On the last day, one of the dealers had this in their stock and gave it to me because he didn't know what to do with it. And I said, oh, I have a wonderful place to put it. And it's been there ever since. I did write the book on treasure craft. So of course I have pieces in my house and I was really lucky to find the dealer plaque. That's a 1960s dealer plaque. You see the 80s, 90s ones a lot more often, but this one's hard to find. Actually, my friend Dave came up with that at the antique mall in Orlando, Florida. And then the figures, the harem dancer and guard, I found the guard by himself and then found the dancer on eBay. And they are very hard to find as well. And I'm going to back out and show you this neat little palmate lamp. My friend Barb 
dearly departed. I had that in her store, Oldies But Goodies in Winter Park, Florida, and I bought it from her then. Dresser is a 1950s piece, and that actually came from a garage in Seattle. Someone had let their kids put stickers all over it. It was a mess. I think I paid under $50 for it. It cleaned up really nice. It's been just great for my purposes. Here's some more treasure craft pieces. These are the Hawaiian made. You have the hula dancer, the uli uli boy in the back, and the drummer boy in the front. And this happens to have, one of them had the original hang tag showing treasure craft of Hawaii. There we go. It also has its original sticker. This guy here, on the other hand, who looks like some guy hanging out at the beach with sunglasses on, is actually a thousand-year-old pre-Columbian San Blas Nayarit figure. It's a shaft tomb figure. They would make these to bury in the upright tombs that the chieftain would be put in on their death. And these little figures were supposed to keep the chieftain company while his spirit ascended into the afterlife. Behind is a Blanco Peacock decanter. Peacock is the color. That's from the mid-60s. I found that at the Webster Flea Market in Florida. Bought it intending to resell it. Happened to set it here in front of this Richard Kirsten piece and that echoed it so well in color and shape that I realized I had to keep it. Kirsten is another Seattle artist and he went through several phases. This is his middle phase. This is about the time he starts becoming a Buddhist and he starts reflecting Near Eastern imagery. This is done in about 1968. I just love the motion, the flowers blowing in the wind. You can see his signature here. He had a studio in Seattle up until very recently. In fact, he may still have it. I, I think he's still alive, but he's got to be about 90 now. We did an estate sale for this gal. Her name was Marie Cat. She never showed her work, but what a great expression of pointillism. I just really enjoy this piece. It's all ink, and she did this in the 1960s. She was a professor of art at Pacific Lutheran University and really very talented, but she never really showed on her own. So she's not known other than for her teaching. The clock here is a Howard Miller, and it swings. This is actually inventory. I've got to get a new cord for it, but it looked fun in the house, so I left it for the time being. Here we have a couple more fun pieces. The print in the back is a Don Blanding piece from one of his books. I collect Don Blanding books, but that one fell apart, so I framed the print. On the right is a Viking piece. Viking Glass did these really great triangular pulled pieces only in the late 60s. It wasn't a common line for them. They had a seven foot tall one in their lobby of their headquarters in West Virginia back in the day that was just like this, except huge. And then on the left here, this is Treasure Craft also. This is a very short lived line. Notice the repeating arches. The repeating arches around the face and at the top indicate that this is done by Raul Coronel. He mainly worked for architectural pottery in Los Angeles. He did a gigantic mural for the American Cyanamid building there, for example. He was a major ceramics designer in the late 60s in California, but he did this line for treasure craft around 1970 with these almost chess piece like figures. And they are very hard to find, and it was just about his only contribution to Treasure Craft. He did it because he was personal friends of theirs, and they were looking for new ideas. Don Blanding, as I said, is an author I really enjoy. He primarily spent his time in Hawaii, although he did do a Florida book and others as well, but he did a lot of this type of illustration. He was something of a silhouette artist, I guess you would say, and also a poet. He also illustrated for some other people as well. So this was the first item that I ever picked out in an antique store. I was 10 years old. It had a Murano label that's worn off now. My parents took me to Bremerton Antiques. The people who run that, Dennis and Debbie Housen, actually still are around. They have Silverdale Antiques and Pastiche on Bainbridge Island in Washington. And my parents said if I behaved well, that I could pick something out. And I did behave well, and this is what I got. I think they shelled out $6 for it. Animal Lore and Disorder. I don't collect a lot of children's books, but I just love this one because my grandparents had it when I was a kid. And look how fun this is. So you open it up. It's a riddle book. You actually flip it, and 
it mixes animals and stories about animals. It's great fun. It's actually kind of hard to find the uh, two that go together. So we have an Ellers or a Torse or a Doxers. Anyhow, I just always thought this was really cute. There is the treasure craft book and just for fun, we'll take a look. This is the one I was sent as an author's copy. There I am at a younger and um, impossibly much blonder age. <laughs> And then here's a whole shelf full of Don Blanding. I've managed to collect just about every one and even a record that he recorded. I just really enjoy his work. Sometime we'll do a little thing just on him. He designed dinnerware and all sorts of other great stuff as well. I always really like this series. I just think it's very sweet, very colorful. And obviously I was looking for a tropical feel for my little co-op apartment because, you know, if you spend a couple of months in winter, somewhere where the weather is nice, why not? And then this large silk screen is by Emmy, and this actually was the daughter of someone that we did an estate sale for. It's from about 1970, and I just love staring into the depth of the flower. My friend Janet gave me these wonderful lamps from her shop in St. Pete, and obviously I've picked up other bamboo furniture. I think the most notable piece would be this. This is by South Pacific. This was, uh, it's funny, it's a little bit of a misnomer because South Pacific actually was a Miami firm, but they thought it looked like the South Pacific. It was right about the time that movie had come out, about 1940, that they were making these. I just love it. It's not quite the full pretzel because you notice the one piece doesn't come down, but it's similar to a pretzel shape. And the more bars, the better. This has four. But it's just really comfortable and it's so much fun for me to be able to have this look and yet have a functional piece of furniture that's nice to sit in. It doesn't exactly match the tropical vibe of the rest of the house, but I just love it and had to keep it. This is a skyline by Virginia Banks. Seattle is known, thanks in part to the Seattle World's Fair, for the Seattle Eight, who were eight modernist artists. Virginia Banks was every bit their equal and a contemporary, but women were not really given the same regard. However, there was a dealer and gallery owner named Zoe Dussain. She believed in Virginia Banks and sold her works. This particular piece, which I think went for 600 new in the 1950s, there's no telling what it's worth now because Virginia Banks has passed on. Everything has been sold out of her estate and she now is getting her due. I like the carved cypress knee. Cypress knees are just cool. It's a Florida thing and I like the face being carved in. So the Turner Flamingo print, that was in a video challenge. We were all supposed to find something for $10 and put it into our decor and that was my choice and I love it. The little shell piece I believe is actually also a Blanco piece and I know that the one to the right, the blue with the stir stick coming out of it is Blanco Nile. That has the acid etched mark from the late 50s. The seahorse is just something that one of our clients did in ceramics class, but I thought it was neat and it was a nice memory of the sale. And then that funky shell lamp, which glows different colors when you turn it on, also came from an estate sale. The TV lamp in the middle with the fish is Treasure Craft. This little guy here is a 1920s souvenir from Germany. Little metal bud base with the alligator. This 50s fish planter was my friend Jonathan's gift to me. He's a great guy. We're going to do his estate sale. He's downsizing and moving, and when things get back to normal, we'll have that. And then down at the bottom here, you'll notice I have a little collection of sunglasses. Let's see here. Funky sunglasses. These kind of things that look like data from Star Trek. These sorts of things that look like they could have been my grandfather's. And then, of course, got to have diamonds. These are all very strange and fun for me, uh, but the ones I like the most I'm going to show you on. So these are my favorite sunglasses of all in my little collection. I got these at a New York City flea market for 10 bucks. They're Japanese from the 60s. And looky there, I love the way they flip up into that almost cat's eye look, and it does actually give you a little more sun protection. And they fit in a little plastic holder that has a hook on it so you can wear it in your lapel. 
And then if you want real dark, you're back to this. Love these things. I've never seen another pair quite like them. Now down here on the bottom shelf, this is an Ibix. And this was done by Don Winton, another big uh, ceramist name. He and his brother Ross had the Twin Winton factory in California for many years. And they shut that down in the late 70s. But he was a sculptor. And Don actually was hired by the Israeli government to cast this so that they could use it as the basis for a major sculpture in Israel. But he was working on that commission when I met him. And he had a couple of these that he had fired, and he was kind enough to give one to me. I thought that was very generous of him. He and his wife were so gracious. I got to meet them when I was writing the Treasure Craft book. This says catnip, and it was made for catnip. It's got a kitty cat on there. And it has a mark on the bottom that says Felix Seattle. Well, Felix was the company these were made for, but actually the jars were made by a company called Potlatch Pottery. Potlatch was a short-lived Seattle pottery in the 30s. A bunch of guys got out of the University of Washington ceramic school. It was the Depression. They couldn't find work. So they started their own company, and right when it started to do really well, they all were drafted and sent into the Second World War, and that was the end of that. So I hope you all have a similarly nice place where you have some really meaningful and interesting and fun things, and I hope you'll show us. In the meantime, I'm going to turn around and show you the one nice thing about this location is that I don't have to be stuck indoors while we wait for everyone to get through this period of time. Because fortunately, there's this nice outdoor deck. Could use a little bit of cleaning, but I've got the concrete flamingos from the 50s. I love these chairs. These came from an estate here in St. Pete. One of them's rusting out a little bit. I'm going to have to work on that, but I just love the shape. These are carved palm trees. These are from 1963, and these were from a house in Vero Beach, Florida. And the reason I like them out here on my deck is because then, while I'm sitting out here, I can watch the whole world go by. Or at least we can sit and stare and wait to get back to our regular lives. This is George the Antique Nomad. I enjoyed showing you a room in my house and I hope that you'll all do the same. Join me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Periscope and we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below Click the bell to be notified when new videos upload. Leave a comment below and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now!